Tom Hartman here on the news. You need to know this. If it can happen in Michigan, it can happen anywhere. That's the calculation that conservatives and corporatists who jammed through a right to work for less law in Michigan are making. President of the right wing National Right to Work Legal Defense Fund, Mark Mix, told the Washington Post, if Michigan can do it, then I think everybody ought to think about it. He then said he's very confident at least one more state will go right to work for less by the end of the next year. Kentucky's Republican Senator Rand Paul weighed in, saying, I support this goal on the national and state level and look forward to Kentucky joining Michigan in the near future. End quote. Even in union strongholds like New Jersey, Republican state lawmakers are floating the idea of right to work for less. New Jersey State Assemblywoman Amy Handlin was quoted saying, I think what happened in Michigan sent a signal that people in states with histories of strong unions are now open to a new perspective. Republican governors in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Ohio have all shied away from jamming through right to work for less in their states, and Michigan Governor Rick Snyder appeared hesitant too. That was until he surprised everyone in his state last week and called on his Republican colleagues in the state legislature to pass a right to work for less law. It's time to strap in. An epic fight for organized labor in America is underway, and the middle class itself is at stake. In screwed news, victims of Hurricane Sandy are the latest hostages of the Republican Party in Congress. The White House is asking Congress to pass $60 billion in federal disaster relief for victims of freak Hurricane Sandy, which killed 131 Americans, destroyed thousands of homes, and left millions of people without power. The Senate has obliged and unveiled legislation to give victims much-needed relief. The Republicans in the House are saying, no way. Instead, House Republicans are demanding steep spending cuts for any disaster relief. Representatives like Steve King, Jeff Landry, and Cynthia Loomis have all demanded offsets for the storm relief. And New Jersey's Republican Congressman Scott Garrett called disaster relief wasteful spending. For the families whose homes are destroyed, Republicans say, you can have some relief, but first we have to cut back on how many cops and firefighters are on the streets. Then we have to cut back on your unemployment benefits and food stamps. Then we have to privatize Medicare and Social Security. And after all that's done, you can get some much needed assistance. This isn't about budget deficits or fiscal responsibility. This is about doing what's moral. And once again, Republicans have dropped the ball. In the best of the rest of the news, if you aid and abet terrorists, you'll end up dead in a drone strike or indefinitely detained in Gitmo. But if you're a big Wall Street bank and you finance terrorists, then guess what? You get a slap on the wrist fine, and then, well, that's it. This week, HSBC Bank settled to pay $1.92 billion in criminal fines for laundering money on behalf of Mexican drug cartels and working with banks in the Middle East that are closely affiliated with terrorist organizations. Chairman of the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation, Senator Carl Levin, described HSBC's culture as pervasively polluted for a long time. So why, why aren't any executives going to Gitmo? And why hasn't the bank itself become a pile of smoldering rubble from a drone strike? because HSBC is too big to fail. And to quote one government source close to the investigation, bringing formal charges against HSBC would be a death sentence for the bank and the rest of the financial system. Given Wall Street's rap sheet of crashing the economy, defrauding investors and homeowners, stealing trillions from taxpayers, ripping off markets by manipulating interest rates, and now assisting drug cartels and terrorist organizations, I'd say a corporate death sentence is long overdue for these bankster institutions. Maybe with Senator-elect Elizabeth Warren nabbing a spot on the Senate Banking Committee, we'll finally see some action. Republicans in Florida will soon celebrate a grim milestone. Sometime next week, the millionth concealed weapons permit will be issued in the Sunshine State. According to Florida's Republican Agriculture Commissioner, Adam Putnam, the landmark gun license is a milestone for privacy protections. Once again, the gun culture is celebrated in Florida and in the rest of the nation. Tragically, two teenagers, Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis, were gunned down in Florida this year by gun-toting Floridians who chose to settle disputes by pulling the trigger rather than talking it out. The millionth concealed weapons permit, combined with the murderous stand-your-ground law, creates a deadly concoction of legitimized violence. Given there are already, on average, 20 multiple victim shootings every year in America, a serious discussion on gun control is long overdue. And to really change these statistics in a positive way, it's about time we start actually doing something about gun control. The rights of the unarmed in America have been ignored for far too long thanks to the deep-pocketed gun lobby. And finally, while Republicans continue their year-round effort to suppress voters, Democrats are fighting back. 
In three states across the nation, Democratic lawmakers have introduced legislation to expand voting rights. In Florida, Democrats are pushing a bill to repeal a law passed by Republicans last year, which made it harder for groups to register voters. In New Jersey, Democrats are trying to bring early voting to their state. Currently, New Jersey is one of 18 states that don't have any early voting, but the Democratic proposal would establish 28 days of early voting in the Garden State. And in Virginia, Democrats are pushing one bill that will make it easier to vote by absentee ballot and another bill that will restore the voting rights of ex-felons. Republicans don't want more people voting because they know their chances of winning elections go down as the voting populace goes up. But, plain and simple, more people voting makes for a more robust democracy, which all Americans should be proud of. And that's the way it is today, Thursday, December 13th, 2012. I'm Tom Hartman on the news.